This is a good move. Why aren't you dancing? Dancing is forbidden. Dancing is forbidden. Hey guys, welcome to Dancing is Forbidden, an Aqua Teen Hunger Force exploration. I am Ronnie, and today is the day. We're jumping in to our first episode, episode one, because we are starting at the beginning, uh, believe it or not, Rabot. Behold the Rabot! So... Rabot was formally aired on September 16th, 2001. However, a rough cut of it was stealth aired on December 30th, 2000, alongside two episodes of C-Lab 2021 and an unfinished pilot of Harvey Birdman, Attorney at Law. So this was before Adult Swim was a thing. These were aired on Cartoon Network. And yeah, Aqua Teen didn't come back until about nine months later. So for the history segment on this one, I'm going to be going with the formal release date, which was September 16th, 2001, because this is the version that is released on DVD that we can see. Unfortunately, to my knowledge, that version that aired the morning of December 30th, 2000, uh, isn't available anywhere, but we do have access to an earlier cut of that. So a, a version that's rougher than the one that was aired. And I will be making a video at some point going between that version and this version, kind of pointing out the differences and talking about it that way. So for this episode, we're just going with September 16th, 2001. And interesting fact here is that this was actually aired after Escape from Leprechaunopolis, which is the second episode. So this technically was aired second uh, in its final state, but it is the first episode made. So we're just going to start the podcast with it. How about that? Before we get into the Aqua Teen, let's talk a little bit about what was going on the week of uh, September 16th, 2001. So obviously, five days previous was 9-11. So basically, right as Adult Swim launched, they were uh, kind of thrown into this, you know, post 9-11 world. The top grossing film that week was Hardball, which grossed over $9 million. Uh, it was also the biggest film the next week as well. I haven't seen Hardball, so I can't really talk to that. But a 6.4 on IMDb is nothing to write home about, I guess. The Billboard Hot 100 number one single for that week was... I'm Real Murder Remix by Jennifer Lopez featuring Ja Rule. Uh, not really familiar with this one, but uh, hey, it sounds pretty good. And the Billboard 200 number one album of this week was... Oh yeah, that's what I'm talking about. The System of a Down's Toxicity this week with... Over 200,000 units sold. What a band. What an album. You know, after all this time, still one of my favorite bands. Nobody really liked them still to this day. Just just a very special band. Uh, it's too bad they can't get their shit together and make more music. But I, I respect the fact that they're just not pumping out garbage. So, you know, it's a double-edged sword. All this to get us into the mind frame of what was kind of going on in America this week when... Uh, when, when this episode formally debuted. Uh, not a big album by any means, but I would like to mention that Telephone Tel Aviv's Fahrenheit Fair Enough came out this week in 2001 on the 18th. If you're into IDM electronica music, very nice album. Check it out. So... Um, <laughs> kind of, kind of difficult starting this podcast with an episode that came out right after 9-11, but kind of have to talk about it. Um, on September 14th, so two days before this episode aired, uh, Clear Channel Communications issued a controversial memorandum to its radio stations containing a list of 165 songs considered lyrically questionable in the aftermath of the September 11 attacks. This list includes Knocking on Heaven's Door, all songs by Rage Against the Machine, and John Lennon's Imagine. So America really cracking down on its content at this time, which, yeah, unfortunate for Adult Swim, which wasn't super edgy at the time, obviously. I mean, this episode of Aqua Teen debuting with a, a PG rating. You know, these early Aqua Teen episodes really aren't that explicit, I guess. But, you know, eventually we get into the, into the TVM territory. But yeah, important to note that when this episode first aired in its rougher state... It wasn't on Adult Swim. It was actually on Cartoon Network because Adult Swim didn't exist yet. Adult Swim came to exist in this month. All right, so a very brief history of Aqua Teen. I don't know why. I just don't want to get into like a huge 
history of the show because you can just look this up, I suppose. But it was created by Matt Malero and Dave Willis, who met and worked together on Space Ghost Coast to Coast, which if you haven't seen it, I assume most of you have, but if you haven't, is a very funny show. Uh, the episode that got me into it was Knifing Around. That episode heavily features Tom York from Radiohead and Bjork as Space Ghost's wife. If you're not familiar with Space Ghost, it was basically the, the cartoon character Space Ghost interviewing celebrities. And a lot of the times what they would do was record it like maybe a, even a normal interview, but then cut it up for the cartoons. So they would have celebrities answering questions that weren't really asked to them. It's just really, really funny the way that they would rehash this footage. But yeah, very similar humor style. And it's actually where Aqua Teen was supposed to debut in a sense. So as Dave Willis tells it, they were kind of tired of running Space Ghost episodes. So they thought it'd be funny to to have an episode where these these characters, a shake, a pack of fries, and a meatball, like took over the episode. And that episode actually never made it to production until after Aqua Teen came out. So we will go over that episode at some point of Space Ghost because you can't see it, but it was it was all done after the fact. But yeah, the idea was to have these characters take over and Dave Willis and Matt Malero liked the idea so much that they ended up wanting to make a show based on them. Now, in that episode of Space Ghost called Baffler Meal, the characters were way different personality-wise. They really didn't resemble the characters that made it into Aqua Teen, but it's a fun bit of history regardless so yeah, Matt Malero and Dave Willis, to my knowledge, write every episode of Aqua Teen, which is nice. Uh, this episode actually doesn't even have a director listed. Both Dave Willis and Matt Malero do voices on the show. Dave Willis doing Carl, Meatwad, Ignignacht, and just a ton of other characters, as he also provided some voices on Space Ghost as well. He, he was not a voice actor, but you know when working on a show like Space Ghost, they would occasionally need side voices. And it was easier just to get someone in office to do it than have to hire somebody to do it. So that's kind of how he got his start. Matt Malero most notably does the voice of Ur, who, uh, you know, we will see these characters in episode four, getting knocked in Ur, the Moon Knights. Matt also does a bunch of other voices as well. For example, the cybernetic ghost of Christmas past from the future. Dave Willis and Matt Malero both went on to create other Adult Swim shows. Dave Willis with Squidbillies and Your Pretty Face is Going to Hell. And Matt Malero with 12 Ounce Mouse. So the other main voice actors on the show are Dana Snyder as Master Shake and Carrie Means as Frylock. Before Aqua Teen, neither of these guys really have any credits in terms of television. So this was, this was their start. Dana Snyder was recommended to the show by a friend of Dave Willis. And Carrie Means was already doing the voice of Thundercles on the Brack show. So that's how he got, kind of got connected. I cannot leave out the late, great C. Martin Croker, who did the voices of Steve and... Dr. Weird at the beginning of these first two seasons. He also does some other character voices. He did a lot of voices on, on Space Ghost, and he helped animate this show, animated Space Ghost, and without this guy, there would be no Adult Swim. So, R.I.P. to C. Martin Croker. At some point, I will explain the stories of these guys, but I just don't want the history segment to be too long. So we'll, we'll go back to them in, in future episodes and kind of discuss their stories if, if you guys don't already know them. Before we finally dive into the episode, I really should mention that the show was pitched to Cartoon Network as like a detective show because, you know, they wouldn't be allowed to just air a show about these food products just doing nothing and hanging out. So they had to have some sort of actual plot element to it, which is very quickly dropped and self-referenced later in the show that they used to be detectives. But these first couple episodes, it's really like a, a monster of the week kind of thing where they have to deal with it. But obviously the way in which they deal with these villains is quite comical. And a lot of the times the villains aren't even villains. They're just kind of like, they, they look scary, but they're just like really mundane creatures. Mike Lazo, who was the executive who they had to pitch Aqua Teen to, who was the creator of Space Ghost and the Adult Swim eventually. He was really hesitant about the idea, but he gave these guys a chance because he trusted them for working on Space Ghost. And hey, it paid off. Thanks, Mike. So this episode starts with a Dr. Weird sketch, as all episodes in seasons one and two do. I won't be going over every single one, or at least I won't be playing them, because a lot of them are just kind of like visual or just random. But as I was saying about them being detectives in these early episodes, the Dr. Weird sketches kind of have a relation so in this episode, Dr. Weird directly creates the villain we see in the episode. So let's hear 
what's going on over at Dr. Weird's laboratory. Located at the South Jersey Shore. Gentlemen, vegetables have threatened man for generations. I have obtained funds to solve this vegetable nightmare. Hey, um... Behold! Uh, Dr. Weird, I thought that grant was for something like the cure diseases. The or... grant? What is that? Uh, <laughs> Shut up! Behold! The robot! Dr. Weird. Now uh, bring me my large French perfume and spray him in the eyes because that's how it happened to me. <laughs> now you feel pretty, don't you? <laughs> the robot, my creation. What has science done? All right, so I'm going to be trying to look at these early episodes because I've seen them so many times, like through the lens of someone seeing it for the first time, like as it's just airing. And because, you know, we're used to all the tropes. And I think because of that, these early episodes are kind of weak compared to the heights of the show. So I'm trying to enjoy them for what they were at the time. And so, yeah, off the bat, we're greeted with Dr. Weird, who visually is just crazy. He He's wearing like a, a purple dress with a gold W on the top showing his bare chest. He's wearing um, golden gloves, kind of similar to Master Shakes, but Shakes are yellow, not gold. Um, but yeah, they, they, I guess they look like dish washing gloves. He has hairy legs, no shoes on, and a helmet over his head. And he has uh, kind of like, like glasses on, like a villain would in like a 60s cartoon. So visually very distinct and next to him is his his assistant steve who's just kind of like a normal looking scientist <laughs> maybe like a like a henchman in like a 60s cartoon because he does have like the glasses on the the uh yellow glasses but yeah he's very meek very just normal so the juxtaposition between the bigger than life cartoonish dr weird is fantastic with steve because steve is basically just always questioning like why did you do that <laughs> why are we doing this this doesn't make any sense again both voiced by c martin croker so we're seen instantly like a dr weird's lab is like a castle on a rock and of like an older animation style because space coast that's all they did was repurpose these old assets because that's all they could afford to do and aqua team kind of started off doing that as well so this this opening shot taken from Johnny Quest, the 60s cartoon. Anyways, yeah, we're open to the always funny joke of Dr. Weird proclaiming gentlemen when it's typically just Steve standing there next to him. He explains to Steve how vegetables have threatened man for generations. And he has solved the vegetable nightmare and unveils basically it's a giant garage door in a sense opens up in the lab and there's a giant robot rabbit, uh, a.k.a. the rabbit. And... <laughs> Just so you, you, you think you know what's going on, you know, somewhat you're following it. But then he just says, spray him in the eyes because that's how it happened to me <laughs> with perfume randomly. It doesn't make any sense. So setting the tone of the show, it's just it, you think you're going one direction. They just throw it out the window and just bring in whatever they want. Hilarious that the, that the, the rabbit makes monkey sounds as it's being like sprayed in the eyes <laughs> instead of I mean, I guess, you know, what what sound does a rabbit make i know they they do make sounds but it's not like a popular sound like you know a cow mooing or a monkey sound that is easily identifiable <laughs> so <laughs> they just go with the monkey sound um so after understandably getting sprayed in the eyes the robot starts to hop away and it breaks through the wall of the lab which honestly is ends up being some of the most continuity in the entire show because they typically will show the hole in the wall and in this early season that is typically why bad things happen because something either comes in or escapes through the hole in the wall there that, that attacks the Aqua Teens later on. The last gag here is Dr. Weird proclaiming, what has science done? But he's the one who did it. <laughs> so uh, it's just funny that he's instantly like, oh no, what is, what, what, this is beyond our control. When he could have not built the robot and he could have not sprayed it in the eyes with perfume. A crazy thought I know. 
this segues into us seeing like the neighborhood that the Aqua Teens live in, which is just kind of like a normal suburban kind of neighborhood surrounded by like a giant city, it looks like. And this is a really nice establishing shot because we get to see kind of their house, which instantly is out of place because it has get out spray painted on it and the door is in the shape of Master Shake. So up until then, it's, it's basically cookie cutter houses and then you see this really strange house. And of course, the Aqua Teens yard is like not mowed at all. It's it's the, the grass is long while, while the grass everywhere else is mowed, which is, is surprising that Carl always maintains his lawn, even though he's pretty lazy. We go over to Carl's house and his his tricked out hot rod sitting out front and the rabbit crushes it, which is basically what the Aqua Teens are going to be investigating for the whole episode. Okay, so from there we go into the intro, which I will not be playing every single episode, but I'm going to play this episode because how could I not? It's iconic. And also, those who have seen the show know that towards the end of the show, once they start changing the show's name, which is a gag we will get to, uh, they get new intros every time. So why not talk about those? So let's, let's hear it one more time, the iconic Aqua Teen Hunger Force theme song. All right, so just a banger of a theme song. One of the best theme songs of all time. I mean, obviously I'm biased, but just just catchy in its own right. Written by rapper Schoolie D, who wrote it while in his limousine on the way to the studio, which shows, I mean, the theme song has nothing to do with the characters. It doesn't make any sense. Like, for example, Meet Wad, Make the Money C, Meet Wad, Get the Honeys G. Uh, he doesn't really do much of either in the show, especially not early in the show. So it's just all nonsense, but it's just so catchy and fun. As far as the video goes, it opens with each of the corresponding Aqua Teen characters dancing in front of like an urban background with like spray paint and stuff in the back. Uh, important here that it establishes that Meat Wad can change shapes. Uh, they show him turning into a hot dog, an igloo, but... In this episode, I believe he only turns into the meat bridge. We'll see if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure he, he doesn't even turn into any of these shapes. But yeah, it establishes what he can kind of do. So after they're dancing around, we get some kind of action shots. So we see them, for example, parachuting from a helicopter over like a fire red background. Then you see them fighting a giant squid. Then you see them busting in on jewel thieving robots. Then flying through space, being shot at by lasers. And then finally being in an explosion like in downtown and in the city somewhere which makes it seem like it's going to be this action-packed show which is hilarious considering like a lot of episodes they're just watching tv or something um and then finally the last shot goes in a completely different direction it's just shake sitting at the table and he bashes his face into uh, spaghetti and he smiles with a spaghetti face on the fridge you'll see there's a picture of the three of them at the beach and a uh, drawing by meat wad that says meat wad's house so this last shot just really going somewhere else considering the first half is like hip hoppy second half is like action packed and then this is just like what the hell so really establishing the show and doing a great job of getting to what the show ended up being i think i can't remember if i if i mentioned it but when this show was stealth aired with an earlier cut this theme song was not in it all right so here we are the first proper scene of aqua teen we are introduced to carl who has not yet been shown who is a balding, fat, hairy man with a gold chain around his neck and a wife beater and blue sweatpants. He is the Aqua Teen's neighbor, and he is walking out to see what has happened to his car. What happened to my freaking car? Good morning, Carl. How's it going? Oh, yeah. Good morning to you there, Mr. Food Monster. This is how <laughs> it's going. Look at my freaking car. It is crushed to bejesus and back. Have you gotten any estimates? Oh, for the friggin'... I just found it this way! Carl! I just walked out Carl, here for friggin' Carl, sake! it's okay! It's cool, man! <laughs> I'm a detective! Clear the crime scene and let me think! Meteors did it! That'll be $20. Hey, Carl. 
Great, we got the fry man up there. I have not called for you, Frylock. What are you doing here? I live here. Well, quit hovering. I am the leader. Man, your car is messed up. How are you going to get to work, Carl? I work out of the home. Frylock, send Carl to work. Hey, then we shall I solve this mystery home. and make $20. <laughs> Do not point that fry thing at me. All right, so yeah, we see Carl freaking out about his car. Shake comes outside to see what's going on. I noticed when when you hear Dana Snyder talking as Shake in this episode, there's like a high-pitched hum to it. There's like a high-pitched tone that you hear, but it is a low-budget show, so so no, no surprise, really. Just kind of interesting. Uh, so you see the detective aspect where Shake says, don't worry about it. Like we're, I'm a detective. I, I can figure out what's happening here. And then he just looks at the car and, and proclaims meteors did it and then says that'll be 20 bucks, which shows a lot about his character off the bat. Um, the characters of these characters are a little different in this episode, but... This is definitely in line with Shake, who he is throughout the show. As he's just like an asshole, basically. And he's lazy. He just didn't even bother to look into it further. Uh, Frylock comes in, and he's flying really high in the sky. Frylock can fly. He just doesn't do it much. Like, he always levitates, but, like, sometimes you'll see him just fly up somewhere. But then other times, I'm pretty sure that, like, like there's problems they have that could easily be solved by him flying, but they just don't address it, which is, of course, for this show, funny. It's not trying to have any continuity, obviously, by the fact that most of the characters die in every episode. Shake is mad that Frylock is up so high. He's like, but I'm the leader, which you don't really think of him as the leader because he's like so... He's almost like a child in a way, but he's, he's just so helpless. He can't really do anything ever. So it's just funny that, you know, he's supposed to be the leader. It made sense in the context of Baffler Meal back when they were written for Space Ghost. But in their own show, it's just, it's pretty funny. And then last thing that I want to talk about here is Carl proclaiming that he works from the home. So getting to work won't be a problem. But the Aqua Teens still want to help him get to work. So we see the first instance of Frylock's power here. Oh, geez. Quickly, Carl! The ray is upon you! Where do you work? I done told you, I work out of the home! <laughs> now stop with the freak beat! Send Carl to the home, then! To the home! Stand my feet! <laughs> oh, my <laughs> hips! My hips! Okay, that'll be $20. Beams come out of Frylock's eyes and basically encompass Carl, lift him in the air, and there's also, like almost like a Dragon Ball Z like energy thing coming out of Frylock's head or, or behind his head rather and they're like alright where, where, where do you work where are we sending you and he keeps saying he works on the home so they send him to the home which amounts to him being thrown into the air and then landing on his roof uh, with his back and great because the show is so cheap he's not animated any differently he's just laying on the on his roof with his hands on his hips still. <laughs> so right off the bat, establishing what kind of character Carl is going to be. He's going to be the punching bag and basically the one who gets the short under the stick from all the Aqua Teens uh, shenanigans. So next we go to a very important spot in the Aqua Teen universe, Carl's pool. So what now, Shake? We shall solve the mystery from Carl's pool. Don't go to my pool. Go to the bank. This is a fun pool. I do like splashing. Yes, playing is for pleasure. We should have a pool. Make us one from the sky, I command it. Yeah, yeah, I'll do that. <laughs> Seriously, I do command it. All right, so, yeah, the Aqua Teens go to Carl's pool. I should mention here that the backgrounds in this episode are kind of strange. They're like 3D rendered as opposed to like the normal 2D stuff that we're used to seeing just because it was cheaper to get different angles of the houses and stuff that way. Carl's pool looks a lot different too. It, it just looks straight out of like a clip art website or something of a pool. I do want to point out that the water animation on the Aqua Teens is actually quite nice for such a low budget show. It's probably the <laughs> nicest effect in the episode. Of note here is Frylock's personality seems a, l a lot more reserved. He, he, he is like the straight man of the group usually, but... He's even more, I guess, of a straight man in, in these episodes. He just seems a little bit reined in than what Carrie Means would end up doing for Frylock. Shake announcing playing is for pleasure. <laughs> it's just strange. So eventually, and eventually he does say dancing is forbidden. So this was kind of a shtick they were going to go with for him was like declaring things. And a big one was going to be declaring things are, are forbidden. But they said they got sick of that very quickly. So I think he only says it once. It's just a fun back and forth of Shake demanding Frylock make a pool. And he's just like, yeah, I'll do that. <laughs> and, then, and then there's just a silence. Just that, That's just the kind of humor I love from this show. 
So they're hanging out in the pool and they keep discussing the case of Carl's car further. I wonder who killed Carl's car. A car cannot be killed. It was murdered by someone who is jealous of Carl's ability to drive. Jealousy is the motivation. Wait to meet one. All right, so great joke of the car cannot be killed. It was murdered. An awesome sound cue there as well when the music gets like super serious after it's kind of loungy of them being in the pool. But yeah, we're about to be introduced to the meat wad. And as it transitions into that, we get a schooly D narration saying, man, don't you know meat don't sleep? And a uh, like a hip hop soundtrack there and a hip hop background with like more of like a cut to the uh, to the alleys of the intro so kind of tying that in they did a lot of these kind of transitions in these early episodes which kind of get dropped eventually so yeah get ready to meet the meat wad and hear the famous slogan that uh, this podcast was named after whoa, 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 whoa. wake up meat wad good morning Father. how are you doing good morning meat wad this is a good thing why aren't you dancing Dancing is forbidden. Oh, yeah. It is mystery time. We have a case to solve. Aqua Teen Hunger Force, assemble! Now, look. <laughs> it's clear to me that meteors have destroyed Carl's car. But he's committed to give us $20. So what I propose we do is to spend that money now before he has time to take it back. And we're going to spend it on what? Candies. My mouse is like, can I go swimming? Look, me, guys. This is Carl's pool, not yours. You can't just decide to go swimming whenever you want. <laughs> but you're swimming right now. What I'm doing is merely swirling the water about. That's not a crime. Uh, Shake, we swam enough now, haven't we? Shouldn't we get going on this mystery? Let's do it tomorrow. It's supposed to snow tomorrow. No, we'll do it now. <laughs> Fine! Aqua Teen Dissemble, because Frylock Baby has to have it. Okay, so a lot going on, uh, I guess, in these two scenes, but I wanted to keep them together, so... We are introduced to Meatwad. He's in like a rundown room underneath deli lights or whatever they use to, you know, keep things heated. And he's also sleeping on a grill. So <laughs> just strange. Uh, the carpet is all torn up and there's a lot of drawings on the walls, which we assume Meatwad did. Um, in this shot, you can see uh, some sort of spiky character similar to Oglethorpe and Emery, who are introduced later in the season. And next to that character, it's, it says, from what I can make out, friend and Jim P. I don't know what that would be. And then there, there's just like a little circle next to it. And it says me next to it. It's supposed to be Meat Wad. Uh, then there's a, a drawing of the danger cart, which is foreshadowing because we will be introduced to the danger cart in just a minute here. And then there's a drawing of Frylock and Shake. Both of them are labeled by Meat Wad. So it's very kind of cute that he's drawing his friends on his wall. Just very, very innocent, very sweet Meat Wad. We also see a lot of troll dolls in Meatwad's room, which I don't think really make a reappearance, but they are very, very ugly. Not like the cute troll dolls. I think we do see some troll dolls later, but they're like normal looking. They're not <laughs> hideous like these. And this is also the only interior shot we get of the Aqua Teen's house in this episode. Uh, I'd like to point out that in, in the... In the rougher cut that we see as an extra on this DVD, that we do get more interior shots. But as of right now, as of this formal airing of the episode, this is the only interior of the Aqua Teen's house that we see. Anyways, Shake wakes up sweet little Meatwad in the rudest way. He just screams at him. Says, whoa, whoa, whoa. He just screams at him. And uh, Meatwad wakes up super chipper. And instantly Meatwad runs over to his boom box. Or sorry, his jam box. Turns it on and starts, starts dancing. There's a... <laughs> Russian text on, on the jam box. I guess it is a, uh, I guess it was made in Russia. And instantly, Shake destroys it and declares dancing is forbidden again, something that they were planning to do more of, but realized it was kind of annoying. And he declares the Aqua Teens assemble. And there's just the saddest look on Meatwad's face when he does this. And it's something you get used to watching this show is Shake just picking on Meatwad, but Meatwad's, he still respects Shake for some reason, even though Shake has absolutely nothing respectable about him. So anyways, in his uh, leadership role in these early episodes, Shake declares Aqua Teens assemble. And then we're back at Carl's pool <laughs> with the lounge music going. Meatwad keeps asking if he can swim, but they are ignoring him and won't let him swim. But uh, Shake comes up with the great idea that they need to spend the $20 that Carl never even said he would give them before he can take it back, which is kind of strange because he hasn't given them anything yet. 
and Shake says that they should spend it on candies. But Frylock, being the more mature one, is like, I think we need to actually investigate this and figure out what's going on. Shake, being lazy, tries to put it off, and uh, Frylock still wins out because I suppose if they didn't investigate it, what really would they do in this episode? So the next scene, which I'm not going to play because it's a visual joke, is we are we see the front of their house, we see the garage door, and there's triumphant music playing, and the door starts to open a little bit, but it's stuck. It keeps getting stuck. They keep trying to open the door, and you just hear Sh- Shake and and Meatwad trying to get this door to open, and then Frylock just flies along the side and just explodes the door with his eyes. Pretty funny joke, but uh, not really worth listening to without the visual. So we see the danger cart, which is literally... Meatwad pulling like a wagon with Shake inside of it with danger cart spray painted on the side. Really nice animation of when they are coming out of the the hole in the garage that is just blown open. Shake's straw like is bent back as they're coming out. Then it, you know, boings back up once they get out of the garage and you hear boing, boing, boing. As they get out, Shake says, hoorah, now I have to go to the bathroom. And then we get a schoolie D cut saying basically, don't you know that you don't have a bathroom? So that's a joke in the show is that they don't actually have a bathroom and the characters even acknowledge it themselves when people have to go to the bathroom. They're like, oh, well, we don't have a bathroom. (laughs) And their excuses for where they go is different a lot of the times. For example, uh, there's a pile of clothes in the hallway that I've been using, (laughs) which is just so gross. But yeah, so Shake has to go to the bathroom. So off to a slow start on this investigation. This this scene just very subversive because it took them forever to get going out of the garage. They finally get out and then Shake instantly has to leave and go to the bathroom. So next shot we get is Frylock in the danger cart and they're waiting for Shake to come back from the bathroom. Where are we going? Shut your deformed mouth, Meatwad, <laughs> before I nail it shut. I will be the one asking the questions. Come on, go! Will you just go? My Frydar is picking up an unusual scent off Carl's car. It is the scent of jealousy. Clearly. It smells to me like perfume. What, what did I just tell you? Well, I was not put on this earth to listen to meat. Frylock, were you? It is perfume. Didn't think so. Whoever killed Carl's car was smelling real good. Whatever, just follow it. Come on. The scent. Do it. Man, I love that line of uh, Shake telling me he wanted to shut his deformed mouth. So anyways, they're kind of just sitting around in the danger cart and... It's, it's, this is an animation and, a, and an ability we see a few times from Frylock in these early episodes. I don't think they really do it later on, but basically a fry sticks out of his bunch in his head and it starts spinning around and making like a, uh, a sonar noise like you heard. He uses that to detect things in these early, at least this first season, but I don't think that he really does it much later on. So yeah, Meatwack can smell that his perfume and Frylock confirms that it is with his with his radar. Next, we get cut to the Powerpuff Mall, which is taken from Powerpuff Girls. Mike Lazo worked on Powerpuff Girls, I believe, and I know Dave Willis really liked that show. And since this was on Cartoon Network 2, he was able to take it and name it after the Powerpuff Girls. All right, so in this scene, we are shown inside of the mall where the rabbit is. It is filling its head with different perfumes and then it shakes up like a spray paint bottle and then it sprays like a mannequin display and it just grows hair all over it. So just taking us off into absolutely insane territory here. The background for this is really nice. I, it was made for the show. I listened to the commentary and yeah, just a really nice, I guess, like vaporwave kind of aesthetic. Just nice pastel colors. Seems like a really great place to shop. But yeah, after after causing that chaos and destruction and hairiness, the rabbit breaks through the wall and just hops away. And then moments later, the Aqua Teens pull up in the danger cart, which we see moves at like one mile an hour and is literally slower than them walking. Because again, it is Meatwad pulling them like as a wheel on this cart. I mean, absolutely, Frylock could get around faster than using the cart, but he still uses it anyways. Slow down, Meatwad. You'll get us all killed. You want to get us all killed? Because you're going to do it. Keep going the way you're going. Oh, yeah. Keep going. Brilliant. The scent seems to be coming from that mall. I know. All right, I want some jeans. I'm the one who wants some jeans. All right, so I probably didn't need to play that clip, but I just love the back and forth between all the characters. For example, Frylock saying, it's coming from the mall, and Shake's just, I know. (laughs) But the only reason Frylock knew that was because it was sonar that he has. Great joke that Shake and Meatwad both want some jeans, even though clearly they they don't wear clothes. I remember being excited to go to the mall, too, when I, when I was a kid, but, you know, for me personally, whenever I, whenever I go back as an adult now, I'm just like, this sucks, dude. 
I also went for the first time in a while, uh, two days ago, I think it was. And yeah, it's still, it's just, <laughs> it's not that great. It's kind of boring. I understand why in this next scene, uh, Shake is kind of bored. It's mostly closed stores these days. Or you go with people and you sit through the stores that they want to go to. And then as soon as you get to the one that you want to go to, they're just like complaining about it. Oh, I want to go. This is boring. Happened to me once. I went with my, my fiance and a bunch of her friends, went, through, went to all their clothing stores like, all right, hey, can we go to the music store? All right, cool. And th- three minutes in, they're, they're complaining after I sat through an hour plus of clothing. I'm telling you, man, the mall, it's a bad time. Oh, I also want to point out here that when the characters come in on the danger cart, you can see that they're basically coming in from off screen as in like blackness because the Powerpuff mall still that they used wasn't big enough to cover the whole screen. So they kind of come in from nothing and the same as the ra- when the robot jumps away you can also see at the edge of the screen it's just jumping into blackness which is really funny and charming because because of the roots of the show and you know it's just great seeing the, the powerpuff girls <laughs> art style here just randomly just this this mishmash of art styles all into this wonderful show so the aqua teens get in the mall and they are in the store the robot was just in moments ago we see frylock behind the counter he's just kind of like inquisitively moving a perfume bottle around and Shake is very jealous that he is back there. What are you doing? What's taking so long? Why are we still here? I'm analyzing the scent. Well, how did you get back there? That's for salespersons only. I want to get back there. Get me back there. Here, take the main bridge. It's right here. <laughs> Meat bridge? No. How close are we to avenging the death of Carl's car? And please say soon, because I am bored. A large quantity of hair growth formula is missing from this counter. Well, as long as we don't go back to the lab. I need to go back to the lab. God, that'll (laughs) take a thousand hours. What sort of twisted fiend would need this much hair growth formula? It's a perfume counter. Obviously, a woman did it. Now let's go! Ooh, hey, Frylock, look at the... You get away from that. That's an emergency exit, and if you set off the alarm and get every one of us in trouble, you'll be the one to go to prison. Not us! That could be a clue. It has nothing to do with this. What's the matter with you? I found it. You'll find the back of my <laughs> hand very displeasing. Now roll on over here. No, I'm not right next <laughs> to my hand. I've done nothing to you. Why are these jeans all covered in hair? Why is anything anything? That is the style from L.A. And that (laughs) is where my manager lives and my agent. Okay? The case is solved. Okay, so I should have explained ahead of time. Um, So the robot broke out of the the store through the wall. And so Miwa says, what is this? It's the big hole in the wall. It's kind of funny here that they supposedly have been in the store a long time because Shake is bored, but they are just at the very end of the clip noticing the hairy pants and the giant robot shaped hole in the wall. So just great whininess from Shake, how he doesn't want to be in that story. He wants to go home. And Meatwad is very proud that he discovered the hole. Also, Meatwad very sweet trying to help Shake get behind the counter by forming into the meat bridge. And Shake's face is just pissed off when he when he sees that. When Meatwad even suggests that he help him out, Shake is just angry about it. And Shake breaks himself through the uh counter which is just great instead of jumping over it or entering the right way which you can you gotta assume that there's a door somewhere to get in he just breaks through it anyways the aqua teens they're ready to go back to the lab so that frylock can run some tests and as they're going through the downtown area they encounter the rabbit himself i'd like to point out that in the earlier draft of this episode that we have you actually do see a lab in their house uh which Obviously, they dropped. Uh, the lab is basically Frylock's room in, in, in every episode after that. But yeah, th- there was a specific room called Lab, and it <laughs> it looked horrendous. Again, I, I plan to do a, a side-by-side, scene-by-scene kind of comparison between the two at some point here. But yes, uh, here we see the Aqua Teens running into the robot for the first time. Shake, aren't you even curious about the hole in the wall, the hairy jeans, all that missing hair growth? No, I don't there? think so. The case is solved. It was Meteor. Meteor did it. I thought you said a woman did it. A woman, a Meteor, whatever. Carl doesn't know. We're the detectives. 
shake. Did you see that? That Afro pick? Yes, and it's mine. I called it. Get away. So we see the robot jumping around downtown and it's just spraying buildings with its concoction. Um, I never picked up before how Frylock mentions that there was missing hair growth formula. I thought it was just all perfume somehow doing this, but I guess there is the, the hair growth formula aspect that maybe everyone else picked up on but me. I don't know. But anyways, yeah, we see Rabot hopping around, cr- causing destruction, turning buildings into big hairy buildings. And Shake sees a, uh, an Afro pick that he calls dibs on and runs up to it. And he is confronted by the Rabot who proceeds to spray him with his special formula. <laughs> I'm beautiful. Oh, look at me, Frylock. I'm beautiful. <laughs> I like the length. Makes me look a little wild. Look, Ow. that rabbit is the thing that killed Carl's car, and we need to stop it. Okay, here's the plan. Indigo is right across the street from here, okay? The hair salon. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm going to go over there and see if they can squeeze me in for a perm. But when I get back... This rabbit's going down. Yeah, thanks, Shake. Thanks a lot, buddy. Take care. I'll be back in an hour. Just great voice acting from Dana Snyder as Shake about to lose his life, just screaming. Instead of dying, he gets a beautiful set of hair. Nice, nice length to it down to his feet. Instantly, Shake is just like egomaniac. He's like, he just decides he's going to go to the, the salon instead of help out and figure out what they need to do about this giant robot. And I, I, I just love, as you heard me laughing in the clip, the, the music that plays when you see him with this long set of, of, of hair. He just instantly like goes from scared to happy. It's just hilarious. So yeah, Shake says he'll be back in an hour, and it's up to Frylock and Meatwad to figure out what to do about this giant robot. Meatwad. What? What's going on? Oh, can I get my time box? Maybe later. Maybe now. I'm going to go get my jam box. No meat wad. Not the jam box. Everybody likes dancing, Frylock. Good going, meat wad. You tamed him with your greasy dance of joy. We get me wad asking if he can get his jam box. Frylock saying no. And there's like this great back and forth between their faces, just looking at each other. And then meat wad just goes and turns it on anyways. It's just, it's just right in the street for some reason. It was already there. He just runs up and turns it on. And starts doing his fantastic Meatwad dance with his little arms out. And the Rabot really likes it. But then Shake comes back donning a new hairstyle since he just got his perm. And he's not pleased with what is going on here. I leave for 45 minutes and this is what happens. Frylock, burn the rabbit down. I don't think we need to do that. He's just dancing. Do it, Frylock, because I said so. Whoa. Ah! Sorry. Way to go. Way to go. You okay? Does it look like I'm okay? Stand back and I shall destroy you. Shakes here with his new hairstyle. I think his old hairstyle was way better. He has like a 70s kind of afro, which I guess ties into him wanting an, that afro pick that he saw. So he tells Frylock to, to burn down the rabbit. Frylock doesn't see a point, but Shake commands him. And since he's the leader, I guess Frylock has to. He shoots like two balls of energy out of his eyes they hit the rabbit, bounce off it, come back and hit shake, which is kind of like a great gag they'll do in the show a lot as, as something bouncing off something else and killing somebody else or, or hurting them at least. And it just burns off all his hair. So now he, he's burnt and he has no hair anymore. And now shake is going to deal with it. And we're about to see shake's power finally at the end of the episode. Shake! 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 Power! Now come over here and slip on it, if you <laughs> dare, rabbit! <laughs> now set the trap, Frylock! Trap? What trap? Go get a trap! I didn't bring no trap. What trap are you talking about? Come on! About? Let's go! Let's go! He's gonna kill us! Just a great sequence here of... So Shake gets big like he's about to push something out of his straw and he does. And it's just, it's just like a little glob of green... I assume milkshake. So you learn that he doesn't really have a power at all. So Miwa can change shapes, which, which I think in, in the show is useful sometimes. Frylock can fly. He can shoot lasers. He can move things with his powers. So he, he's very powerful. 
And Shake can't do anything. He's just an asshole. <laughs> and then a great line with him him telling the rabbi to come over here and slip on it, which again is another joke they'll go back to later where someone will do something. They're like, yeah, come over here and get some of it, basically. It's very funny. The rabbi does not slip on it and the Aqua Teens have to run away because there's nothing they can do against it. Before they can escape, though, poor Meatwad gets squished in the madness. So we get a, we get a schoolie D transition, a final one saying things is looking shady for the Aqua Teens. And I'd like to point out after these transitions, every scene basically opens with an explosion, <laughs> which is very over the top given the content of the show so far. So we meet the Aqua Teens back at Carl's pool inexplicably, like they were just downtown and now they're suddenly just back to safety. Also, Meat Wad is here and he is not dead, not squished. He's, he's fine. Don't worry. I've called this meeting to say that downtown is no longer safe. <laughs> so in short, we need to pick some new restaurants and nightclubs. Get out of my freaking pool! It's just very funny that the Aqua Teens have resigned to the fact that the, the rap out has taken over downtown and they can't go there anymore. And that's it. You, you see you see the rabbi dancing with a bunch of hair-covered buildings surrounding him. And then great line from Carl telling them to get out of his freaking pool. Very iconic line. Meatwad, not even in the pool in this episode. Very sad. He's just sitting by the pool with a big smile on his face because he's probably just happy to be with his friends. So yes, that is the end of the first Aqua Teen episode. I think watching as many times as I have for this podcast made me like it more than I did initially. Not a great Aqua Teen episode, but not a bad one either. It's just because I think the show gets so much better. But imagining seeing this for the first time with having no prior knowledge to Aqua Teen definitely does, I think, I think a good job of introducing the show and the characters. The personalities are a little bit different. The animation style is a little bit different in terms of the background images not being what they will be eventually. But very fun monster idea, even though he's probably one of the weaker monsters in, in all because he has no personality as opposed to some of the hilarious monsters that we'll see soon. But still, just the, the bizarreness of it is great. You're introduced to the fact that the three Aqua Teens are pretty, pretty useless. Uh, besides Frylock, I guess he, he's very smart and he has great powers, but Shake's just a self-entitled asshole and Meatwad is just an innocent like child. <laughs> And in the end, they, I guess they figured out what happened to Carl's car, but they, they couldn't do anything about it. In total, I'm going to rate this episode 3.5 Harry Jeans out of 5. It's an alright episode. It's not bad. It's better than I gave it credit for. But yeah, guys, that's it for this episode. Thank you so much for listening to the end. Apologies on how much exposition there was at the beginning, but it felt kind of weird just to go in dry without explaining any of, the, any of the characters or anything like that, the creation of the show, all that stuff. Or maybe it would have been funnier. I don't know. Again, I don't think these early episodes are as strong as the show gets, but I'm assuming that's how the podcast will be, where these early episodes of the podcast will probably suck as I get into the swing of things and get used to making them here. Just thank you so much for listening. If you want to reach out to me, you can email me at dancingisforbiddenpod at gmail.com. You can find the podcast on dancingisforbidden.com. Find me on Twitter at AquatinePod. Just, yeah, feel free to get in touch. Let me know what you think of this episode of Aquatine, uh, what you think of Aquatine as a whole, what you thought of this podcast, whatever, dude. I'm lonely. Just message me. Is that so much to ask for? Thank you guys for listening, and I'll see you next week for Escape from Leprechaunopolis. Uh, which was the first episode actually aired aside from the stealth airing in 2000. So yeah, have a good week, guys. Hey.